open your Bibles, please. The message I'm going to preach tonight, it'll sound an awful lot like about 500 of you have heard around the country. But uh, before I preach it very long, you won't recognize it. <laughs> it's uh, sort of a launching pad. is the same place where we've been before in numbers of places around the nation. Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I want to read verses 18 through 20. The very famous Great Commission, or for those of you who believe in lifestyle evangelism, the Pidlin Commission. In verse 18 of Matthew chapter 28, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All powers, that's, that's pretty, 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 pretty lot of power, a heap of power. All powers given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, that means because of what it be for. Because we got all this power, he has it all. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, or evangelize, or win souls. All nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And oh, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Now turn over, please, if you would, to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter number 1. Acts, chapter 1. I'd suggest you, confident, you uh, lifestyle evangelists, don't read the book of Acts at all. I'm sure I wasted my time there. You probably don't already. The former treatise, Have I Made, O Theophilus? This is Dr. Luke talking. He wrote another book called Luke. He's talking about that book. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Now, before I pray, I want to say this. I, as you can tell, as you can tell, I'm a horse. I'm not a horse from preaching. Truth is, I haven't preached a sermon since Sunday night. I'm a horse from an infection of some kind that keeps battling on and uh, just a low-grade temperature that uh, it's not making me sick at all, it's just making me hoarse. I don't know where my voice is going to end up tonight, but I know when it's going to end up. A good time from now. So, I do not know exactly what key I'll be in, but I'll be keying on a lot of people before I get through. You see, you see, I'm sort of, I'm sort of mad. Uh, well, I'm not mad because people have been unkind to me. I'm mad because people have been unkind to that. And uh, I reminded you this afternoon that it took me 30 years to get mad. Jesus said, God said, be slow to anger. He didn't say, don't get mad. He said, just don't do it in a hurry. In 30 years, there's plenty of time to wait. And so I'm mad. And uh, I want you to hear me out tonight. I'm not sure exactly what the voice is going to be like, but I know you're going to hear whatever it's like for a while. Our Heavenly Father, I, I heard you inside tonight. I hurt because the things that are most precious to me are being forsaken, forgotten, criticized, slandered, attacked by those that even dare to call themselves fundamentalists. I pray tonight you'd fulfill the purpose of God in this hour. 
In Jesus' name, amen. The Great Commission says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. There are four imperatives in the Great Commission. First is go. Second is teach or evangelize. Third is baptize. Fourth is teach them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus had commanded to them, he said. So there are four imperatives. Go, get people saved, get them baptized, and then teach them what Jesus commanded them. Now, in the first chapter of Acts, we read a while ago, the Dr. Luke said, the former treatise, that's the Gospel of Luke, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. I have 18, no, I have 22 Schofield reference Bibles in my office. I personally use the Schofield reference Bible all the time. I use it to study from. And for the most part, I like the Schofield reference Bible. But Mr. Schofield was wrong on some things. Mr. Schofield was not a Baptist. He was a brethren, I think it was. He, uh, he was wrong on some things mainly on the doctrine of the church. Now, <coughs> Mr. Schofield says concerning uh, Acts 1-1 that the verse is saying that Jesus started something in the Gospels and the Holy Spirit continued in the book of Acts what Jesus started, and that is not true. The Holy Spirit didn't take up anything that Jesus started. The Holy Spirit started it. Jesus himself, when he preached his first sermon, his home synagogue, the Bible said he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he himself chose as his text, Isaiah 61.1, and the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Jesus did not do what he did in the Gospels, he did not do them in his own power as God. He did them in the power of the Holy Spirit. So he could be our pattern and our example to show us that we could do what he did. That's why he could say in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. He was simply saying that he started something in the Gospels, the Holy Spirit started it <coughs> through Jesus, and the Holy Spirit continued that work through his people in the book of Acts. Now, I make an issue out of this. I want to make three or four statements, and uh, it'll offend a few of you, but uh, the rest of you don't be offended because you're not offended because I'll give you ample opportunity to get offended later on. <laughs> Mr. Schofield is wrong on one issue especially, and others are wrong. With the coming of the book of Acts, there were no changes. With the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new gospel. There are those who say that John the Baptist preached one gospel, and the apostle Paul preached another gospel. They're wrong, dead wrong. Never has been but one gospel. Adam was saved by grace through faith. Abel was saved by grace through faith. Moses was saved by grace through faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and was saved by grace through faith. Never has been but one gospel. With the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new gospel. Not only with the coming of the book of Acts was there no new gospel, but hang on to your Schofield Bibles tightly now. With the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new church. Mr. Schofield says the church was started on Pentecost, and he's doubly wrong. Wrong because the church that he's talking about doesn't exist. He's talking about all believers forming a church, and there's no such thing as that. The word church in the Bible is the word ecclesia, which means a called out assembly. All believers have never been called out, nor have they ever assembled, so they did not form a church. If you didn't have a Schofield Bible or Larkin's chart, you wouldn't believe that. 
Now, the second thing Mr. Schofield's wrong on, not only is there no invisible church. See, here's his, here's his reasoning. <coughs> he talks about the local church, and then he calls the invisible church the true church, which implies to me that the local church is not the true church. You know better now, Mr. Schofield. If you had talked to me before you wrote this Bible, you'd gotten that straight a long time ago. I'm not preaching you any heresy. I'm preaching Baptist doctrine. Our Anabaptist forefathers did not believe in the universal church or the invisible church. It comes from the old mother of harlots, El Papa himself. The word Catholic means universal. And that universal church doctrine has been handed down from the Catholics, the Protestants, the non-denominationalists. We Baptists have swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. And as I said the other night, it's a very interesting thing that when these invisible church people want to raise some money, they always go to the visible churches to raise the money. Because invisible churches raise invisible money, and you can't deposit invisible money. I, now, there will be a day when all believers will be a church. That's when the rapture takes place. <coughs> all believers are called out to meet the Lord in the air. And then and then only will we become a called out assembly. Spoken of in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23 where it says, The general assembly of the church of the firstborn assembled in heaven. Now then and only then will we all believers be a church because then and only then will we become a, call, we be, will we become a called out assembly. Now, there's a third mistake that Mr. Schofield makes, and this one, I think, maybe we'll gather a few more enemies as we continue to roll the ball down the hill. <laughs> Not only was there no new gospel with the coming of the book of Acts, not only was there no new church with the coming of the book of Acts, because the, local, the church was started sometime in the earthly ministry of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 18, it says, if you've got a problem, take it to the church. Mr. Schofield says right above that, says uh, discipline in the future church. You can't take a problem to a future church. you got to take it to a present church. <laughs> then in Acts chapter 2, it says they were added to the church. You can't add to what ain't there. And uh, so when Jesus sometime in his earthly ministry before Matthew 18, I think maybe in Matthew 10, he, <coughs> he called out a group of people and assemble them and started what we call the New Testament church. Now, not only was there no new church with the coming of the book of Acts, and was there no new gospel with the coming of the book of Acts, but there, hang on to your larkin seats now. Hang on to your, uh, your dispensational britches. With the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new dispensation. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new dispensation. I don't mind you piddling around with dispensationalism, and I sure, I'm sure there is some, some dispensational teaching in the Bible. But for you to talk about, like Mr. Schofield did, that there was one day a dispensation of the law, and now a dispensation of grace, that irks the fire out of my Baptist brains. I used to sit and hear preachers talk about the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace. And I had the same idea that you have, many of you. You have the idea, and I had it, that there was a day in the Old Testament when men were saved by keeping the law. But in the New Testament, they're saved by grace. If you didn't have a Schofield Bible or Larkin's charts, you would never in this world come up with any such thing as a dispensation of grace. Bless your little pea-picking, cotton-picking heart. The dispensation of grace started as soon as man fell in the Garden of Eden and will continue until the last man is saved in the millennium. The dispensation of grace always has been, always will be. God's grace did not begin with the coming of Bethlehem. God always was saving people by grace through faith. And the purpose of the law in the Old Testament is the same purpose of the law in the New Testament to show man that he's exceeding sinful and cannot save himself and cause him to get to Jesus in a hurry. Now, I said, 
with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new gospel. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new church. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new dispensation. Let me explain what I'm saying. In the Great Commission, Jesus said, go, get them saved, get them baptized, and then tell them, teach them whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, that, that last thing I want you to notice. Jesus did not say in the Great Commission, teach them what I taught you. Now, I think we ought to teach the teachings of Christ. And there are other places in the Bible that remind us that we should. But the Great Commission is not talking about doctrine. It's talking about soul winning. When, when Jesus said, I, he, he, he gathered this little crowd, a little group of people, up in a mountain, and he said, I want to give you some instructions. I want you to go. I want you to get people saved. I want you to get them baptized. But he said, when you get those folks baptized, I'll not be here. So I cannot look at them as I'm looking at you and say to them, you go and get folks saved and get folks baptized. So since I will not be here to tell them to go and get folks saved and get folks baptized, he said, I want you to tell them for me to go and get folks saved and get folks baptized. Jesus is not talking here about your teaching Baptist doctrine or teaching security of the believer. He's talking about you teaching them to obey the great commission of God and get people saved. He's saying that I'm supposed to get you saved and get you baptized. That I'm supposed to teach you how to get her saved and get her baptized. Then you're supposed to teach her how to get him saved and get him baptized then you're supposed to teach him how to get her saved and get her baptized. Then you're supposed to teach her how to get her saved and get her baptized. Then you're supposed to teach her how to get him saved and get him baptized. Then you're supposed to teach him how to get him saved and get him baptized. Then you're supposed to teach him how to get him her saved and get her baptized. Then you're supposed to teach her how to get her saved and get her baptized. Now, if you, if you understand it, I won't go through the whole crowd. Now, you, you theologians that think you know so much and know so little, you listen to me. You'd like to think this is talking about doctrine because you don't want to dirty your knuckles out knocking on doors. But Jesus is not talking about doctrine here. He's talking about soul winning. He's saying go and get them saved and get them baptized and train them to go and get them saved and get them baptized. About the same thing is said in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Turn to it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 2. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to to teach others also. Now there are five generations in this little verse. Paul said, faithful witnesses, that's number one. Taught me, that's number two. Timothy, I'm teaching you, that's number three. Timothy, you choose faithful men, that's number four. You tell those faithful men to teach others also, that's number five. Now, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that I received a body of truth I receive that from faithful witnesses. Now, Timothy, I have taken that and preserved it and handed it down to you. Now, Timothy, you take it from me and you guard it with your life and you hand it down to faithful men. And you tell those faithful men to take it from, from you, to guard it with their lives and hand it down. Jesus said to the apostles, I'm giving you a body of truth. You guard it, hand it down. They did. And they took it and guarded it and handed it down. And they took it and guarded it and handed it down. And they took it and guarded it and handed it down. And they took it and guarded it and handed it down. And they took it and guarded it and handed it down. Now then, it has come to our generation. The, the body of truth is now in our hands. 
God is saying he wants us to do what every other generation has done, and that is to take the body of truth that has been preserved since Jesus himself walked the shores of Galilee and the dusty trails of Judea. He said it is our job in the 20th century to take the same truth and the same body of truth that our Lord preserved and handed down, and they preserved and handed down, and they preserved and handed down, and they preserved and handed down. Now it's up to you and to me to preserve the old time religion that Jesus handed down to us. I'm sick at my soul of what's going on in what's called fundamentalism. I said today, I'm not splitting fundamentalism. It's done split. And we have not gone anywhere. We're exactly where they used to be. And the crowd that's criticizing us preach what we preached 15, 20 years ago. Now they dare to change the faith once for all deliver the saints and point their, their ecclesiastical fingers at us and say, we are splitting fundamentalism. I'd like to say to that crowd, come on back home. Come on back home. We're right where you used to be. Now there's several things that I've guarded for these many years. 43 years nearly of pastoring churches. I want to call your attention, several of them. Those of you that heard this sermon, when you, when you think I'm through, I'll just be starting. <laughs> Number one, I have guarded for 43 years the same gospel that was handed down to me. I never thought I'd see the day when Baptist preachers would not preach the true gospel. Tonight, all across this nation, Baptist preachers have succumbed to the heresy of John MacArthur. I said the heresy of John MacArthur. I said the heresy of John MacArthur. And somebody that's got several thousand people to hear them who can go across this country has got to alert Baptists that we have false teachers in our midst who are no longer teaching and preaching salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. <laughs> Folks, we're fighting for our lives tonight. I mean, this is not any vendetta. This is not any, any, any trip I'm on or we're on. We're fighting for our lives. I mean, Baptist preachers are preaching tonight Arminian doctrine. They're preaching Mr. MacArthur's heresy of lordship salvation that says that you must accept Jesus as your Savior and accept him as your Lord in order to be saved. Well, bless your heart, whatever happened to babes in Christ then? Whatever happened to growth and grace? You'll never make Jesus Lord of your life till you awaken his likeness. Was Jesus Lord of Peter's life when he cursed and swore and denied the faith? Was Jesus Lord of righteous Lot's life when he was down in Sodom? Was Jesus Lord of Abraham's life when he left the will of God, went down to Egypt? Was Jesus Lord of Elimelech and, and Naomi's lives when they went down to Moab? Let me tell you something tonight. If you go to heaven, you'll go to heaven for one reason, and that is you accepted the gift that Jesus has paid for. There is no other way. There is no other way. There is no other way. Same gospel. Those preachers that preach with a gun in one hand for deacons' meetings <laughs> and a Bible in one hand for the WMS. Those old-fashioned circuit-riding preachers, preaching beneath the stars at night, preaching under brush arbors, under tents, little country churches, almost not enough to feed their families. Those men of God had one message of salvation, and that was by grace through faith plus nothing. Now, 
Now, if you don't believe what I'm preaching, then be at least honest and quit calling yourself a Baptist preacher. You defector. You Benedict Arnold. Take the word Baptist off your church sign. Take the word Baptist off your stationery. Let the Charismatics preach Arminian doctrine. Let Baptists preach salvation by grace through faith. Let the Nazarenes preach you got to earn it. Let Baptists preach it's a free gift of God. Let the Church of God proclaim an Arminian heresy. Let Baptist people proclaim that Jesus saves, it's free of charge, he paid for it, I accept it, and it's mine. I'm mad tonight. I'm mad. I'm sick of it. I'll be quiet no longer. No way, Jose, no way. I'm not going to let that crowd of compromisers steal our preacher boys without a fight. I'm not going to let them do it. Oh, I tell you, the professors in our schools are not going to teach salvation by grace. Let the school change its name. You let one professor in Hiles Anderson College ever even imply that salvation is not by grace through faith, I'll guarantee you he'll be selling peaches in Georgia by Monday morning. You don't like this preaching, you can lump it any way you want to lump it. Some of you females sitting out there looking at me like a cow looking at a new gate, don't blame me because you never have met a man before. You so used to that little robe telling well a fellow you got for a husband. And you pull him across the Don't you look at me that way every time you frown at me like that and shake your head. You adding 15 minutes to my sermon tonight. Hey, hey, Buster, why don't you look at her and ask her if you can say amen? tonight is the same thing that Baptist folks had bled and died for. Our founding fathers in New England were drowned and martyred because of the doctrine I'm preaching tonight. We're fighting for our lives tonight. Not only have I received a gospel and for 43 years guarded that gospel of my life, not only have I handed down the same gospel I received. Now, don't get mad yet. There'll be plenty of time for you to get mad after a while. If you get mad now, you'll kill somebody before it's over. There's a lady sitting back not far from me. If she smiled, her, 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 her cheeks would bleed from the cracking. You listen to me. You listen to me. Salvation is free. Salvation is free. God's gift. Not only, now not only have I guarded that same gospel, but there's a certain, some certain standards handed down to me. That I've guarded. I remember when I was a kid preacher, old Forrest McElroy, six foot four inches tall, had a finger six foot four inches long. I remember how I used to preach. Salvation by grace. Then I remember old J.C. Sizemore, about five foot six, seven inches tall, a little short kind of a guy. Oh, he was against everything. Everything. Nothing he was for. You know, you know what? You, you, say, you ought to have a good spirit. Have you ever heard these rascals preach against us? Yeah. Well, I, 
was in a motel room, turned on the news, the news was over, James Robinson came on. He had a guy from over in Europe where they hadn't seen a revival since Moses was a boy. And that rascal was making fun of us. Making fun of us. Well, bless God, we making, I'm making fun of him. My old pastor, J.C. Sizemore. I never knew a guy preached as strong against sin as he did. We had 12 ladies in the church, caused him trouble. He preached his sermon on the dirty dozen. is pricking some of your culture, isn't it? I wouldn't give you a dime for all you put on culture. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough. Our pastor said, he said drinking was wrong. He meant beer, wine, martinis, Whiskey, all of it. That's what he handed down to me. And yet, the honest truth is, Fuller Seminary took a poll just a few years ago. Over 50% of the student body said they all saw nothing wrong with drinking alcoholic beverage. My old pastor used to say dancing was wrong. Didn't matter whether it was square, round, rectangular, octagon, or oblong. Didn't matter if it was ballroom, dish rag twist, bowl weevil wiggle, didn't matter what it was. It was wrong. So he handed that down to me. Now, bless God, for 43 years, I preached it just like my pastor handed it to me, and I've handed it down to you young preachers. And woe be to you if you don't preach it. My old pastor used to preach to me that card playing was wrong. Well, he handed that down to me. <coughs> now for these years, I have preserved it, and I'm handing it down to you. My old pastor used to preach to me that mixed bathing was wrong. Now, Matilda, Don't get your little feelings upset. I was out visiting one day. Big old six foot four inch policeman was there. A little wife with him had been to our church Sunday before. I said, I want to thank you for coming. She said, we're not coming back. He didn't say it. She said it. If my wife had said that, I'd have been there in 10 minutes. I'd have gone back now. Or if your wife would have said it, I'd done the same thing. I said, why aren't you coming back? Oh, she said it was unrefined. And I said, thank you. She said, you said that men had evil thoughts and they saw women's thighs. She said, that's not true. And I said, ma'am, which gender are you? Since when are you qualified to know whether women's thighs make men think holy thoughts or not? She said, just ask George. I said, how about it, George? He said, well, I said, how about it, George? She said, how about it, George? I said to her, I do not know whether women have evil thoughts, if they see men's thighs or not. But I said, if George can think of amazing grace, 
while he's out bathing on a beach. He's either from San Francisco or to go to a doctor. Now you listen to me. If mixed bathing was wrong 50 years ago, she's still wrong. But you say, preacher, we're from Florida. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're from Afghanistan, Pakistan, where you're from. Brother, it is wrong for women to show their thighs to the public. It's wrong. Well, you say, Brother Hiles, if you preach like that, you won't get a crowd. Well, if you preach like that, don't preach like that. You don't deserve a crowd. And before you criticize me, I'm preaching exactly what you preached 30 years ago. My old pastor said to me, we're going to divide the crowd here. My old pastor said to me that, <coughs> that women are supposed to wear skirts. That's what he said. And men were supposed to get haircuts. You know, we got some of the cutest little Shirley Temple fellows here I've ever seen in my life. You guys that go get your hair styled instead of cut. I know what you're saying. Legalist, 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 legalist. I was preaching in a so-called Christian school. When I finished preaching, the press principal came up and publicly, in front of the student body, said, we don't agree with your position. Of course, he had to. His job was at stake. Those kids might have fired him. So, he said, that's legalism. Now, let me tell you something. If you don't know any more about the Bible, than to think that getting a haircut is legalism, you ought to start making an honest living somewhere. Legalism is when you add anything but grace through faith to God's redemptive plan. If this Bible teaches one thing, it teaches separation. Jesus did, did talk about hair. Paul did talk about hair. And the Bible does talk about women's dress. As principal said to me, you have standards. I said, so do you. He said, but you have dress standards. I said, so do you. He said, no, we don't. I said, then you'll allow any of these kids to come to school nude tomorrow, right? He said, no. I said, legalist, 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 legalist. grandparents were not legalists when they made boys go to the barber shop every two weeks. Our grandparents were not legalists when they said a woman is all dressed in modest apparel. I'm saying that's what was handed down to me. Do you know, talk about old John Rice. See, you don't know the John Rice I used to know when he was a young preacher. He preached a revival meeting in Waxahachie, Texas, when I was a kid. He heard about some of the young folks in the church that were going to Lover's Lane. So one night they called off the meeting. Dr. Rice went to Lover's Lane. He announced the next night he's going to read the license plate numbers of all of Baptists in Lover's Lane. Night before. That's the kind of preaching we need. Yeah. Old Oliver B. Green one night was preaching to me. He stuck his leg up like that on the puppet. One lady said, ooh, that's not nice. Old Oliver B. Green said, said, sister, he said, this is my pulpit, and these are my britches. If I want to split my britches on my pulpit, it's my business. Yeah. Boy, America's dying tonight. For some old-fashioned Oliver B. Green, Lester Roloff, John R. Rice, preaching. The last hope, the last hope 
of standards left in America is in the hands of a few of us independent fundamentalists. There was a day when you saw a charismatic walk down the street, you could tell them by their dress. Look like ho ho whores from Hollywood now. And a lot of them are. There was a day when you could see a Nazarene walking down the street and tell him by his dress. There was a day when you could see a church of God walking down the street and tell him by his dress. There was a day you could see an independent fundamental Baptist walking down the street and tell him by his dress. If the people in this room tonight Dip our sails on standards and convictions and separation. The next generation will have no voices at all to teach the separation of this book and of our forefathers. Not only has there been handed down to me a gospel that I have preserved and handed down to you young preachers. Not only has there been standards handed down to me that I have preserved and handed down to young preachers, but there has been a soul winning handed down to me. Soul winning is fighting for its life in America tonight. I am so sick of all the substitutes for soul winning. I was up in Maine preaching. Cute little guy walked up to me. <coughs> he said, Dr. Hyas, could I ask you a question, please? He said gaily. I said, yep. Do you have a coffee shop ministry in your church? I said, what did he, what, what did he? He said, a coffee shop ministry. I said, would you, sir, I think. Look, get it when I tell him. I haven't got time to wait for you. I said, sir, what do you mean by coffee shop ministry? He said, well, you get you a room in the church, and you paint it with psychedelic colors. Then you let your boys grow their hair down to their shoulders. <coughs> and then the girls wear blue jeans. And he said, then you get some guitars, and then you get some rock music and put religious words to it. And then what happens is that the hippie crowd liking that kind of music and atmosphere and pants on the girls, long hair on the boys, they come in and you tell them how to get saved. I said, no. He said, no what? I said, no, we don't have a coffee shop ministry in our church. And I said, we don't plan to have one. You don't have to become gay to win queers. This is dedicated to about three women here tonight. They would walk out, but we'll know who they are. How do you expect, he said, to win young people of this age if you don't have a coffee shop ministry? And I said, sir, I think, how many young folks did you have Teenagers, your church last Sunday. <coughs> he said, 40. I said, we had more than that in the toilets. <laughs> I said, last Sunday, we had over 4,000 teenagers in our church. Every one of them heard an old fashioned leather long barn, storming, window rattling, shingle pulling, hell raising, old fashioned separatist sermon. All of them did. You've seen these teenagers trotting across this platform tonight. 
And this week, you've seen these kids trotting across this platform. They're used to this kind of preaching. That's why they came. It was the same type of methods I'm using tonight that the dirty hippie crowd used to rally the teenagers of America to the hippie business. It was a crusade. Now I say, let's have a same type crusade for Jesus. Years ago, when I was a youngster, a deacon named Jesse Cobb came to me and asked me if I wanted to go soul winning with him. He handed me the old Roman road. I've got a sneaking suspicion he taught Joe Boyd how to be a soul winner too. Old Jesse Cobb, little short guy, he handed to me a certain type of soul winning. Ever since that day, on a Sunday afternoon, when I visited my first unsaved person, went into Christ that night, I have preserved the old Roman road plan of salvation. So many. And I've handed that same thing down to you. I heard Dr. Walt Hanford say, the Southwide Baptist Fellowship, I was there and heard him say it. He said the Bible is a book of a divine message, but it is not a book of divine methods. Mr. Hanford, you're wrong. This book not only tells us the message to preach, but it tells us how to get it out. So win and bless God. 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 So win. That's the message of God. So win. And I'm mad. You say you shouldn't get mad. Don't you tell me if somebody raped your wife, you'd make him king for a day. If you wouldn't be mad, I wouldn't give a dime for you. They're raping my savior. They're silencing the message of redeeming grace. If we don't leave this place and leave this place with a holy desire and compassion for the unsaved people to reach them for Jesus and to go soul winning and keep on going, soul winning as we've known it won't be alive in 10 years in America. I know people, preachers who've come to our pastor school we talk about soul winning. They start, go home and start it. Their church begins to grow. After about three years, they have a little plateau or leveling off period. So the next year, they trot out to John MacArthur's school to find another way of growth. Soul winning is not a way of growth. Soul winning is not an alternative. Soul winning is a command from our general saying, you go. It's God's command. You have no choice in the matter. You're either a soul winner, you hear me well, you're either a soul winner or you are not right with God. But you say, Brother Hines, I serve on the flower committee. I don't care how many petunias you put on the communion table. God's command is soul winning. Not only have I received a gospel and kept it and preserved it and handed it down to those that follow me, not only have I received some standards, same thing Brother Sizemore preached 45, 50 years ago, Brother Hiles is preaching in 1990. Not only have I received a certain soul winning command and guarded that thing with my life and handed it down to those that follow me. I have received a certain kind of preaching. 
preaching. I said preaching. I didn't say exegeting. I said preaching. I didn't say Bible exposition. I said preaching. You say, what is preaching? It's teaching to stop and holler between sentences. We put the training of our preachers back in the hands of preachers again. The young men tonight in this room already decided to go to a college next year where you're going to sit at the feet of a dead theologian that doesn't even believe that book is the Word of God. Who couldn't preach his way out of a paper sack and couldn't draw, draw flies in the garbage dump. Old-fashioned preaching. That's what built this country. Here's what we have now. you to get my book on possibility thinking. Let me remind you to get my book on the book of Acts. Ain't no way, no way man can preach in one of these things and be a fundamentalist. Let's just put it like it is. That's Catholic stuff. That's Episcopalian stuff. That's Lutheran stuff. That's Baptist stuff. Preaching. 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 not that way. This is the way it is. Now, the nationwide telecast is on the air. wonderful to us. Hey, I got some good news for you. She broke down and laughed then. The woman did. I, I've, had a, I've had a really rough day and I want to encourage but he our doing is office. able. No, he's able. He's able. Listen, I, our Jaguar was being serviced today, and I had to drive the Corvette. Oh, did you really? Oh, my soul. And the license on my Corvette is not even personalized yet. Oh, my soul. And listen, you had to drive our Corvette today? And do you oh, know, no, the Jaguar is not working. It's supposed to snow tonight, and Fido's doghouse heater was broken. Is that right? I'll declare. But. Hey, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. I see a doghouse out there. <laughs> I see that doghouse. In Jesus' name. Heal that heater. Darling. 
have a word of knowledge. Hold it. She hold it. She has a word of knowledge. A lady named hold Renee. It. Shh. A lady named Renee, I believe from North Carolina. Renee, that pot you left cooking, don't worry, the fire didn't get past your kitchen. <laughs> I have another word of knowledge. What's the other one? I believe it's a Pastor Cunningham. I think he's from Canada. Pastor, that check that bounced, you know, a big check. You just cover it with that uh, love gift you took for hungry people. Nobody will know the difference. That's right. Praise Brother. Jesus. Get up here. You have a garter. Be healed, follow up. And that's what we call Christianity today. And you sit there and watch that garbage for the hour. Now you listen to me. If you're going to be on TV, preach on TV. Throw you on that bedroom scene. Get you a pulpit scene. Preaching was handed down to us. I know what some of you are saying. I didn't come to get this. You just thought you didn't come to get this. Well, I'm not going to come back next year. That's why I'm plucking your tail feathers this year. Right here. Help him, fellas. Somebody do something. Take the sheet off and face it toward the people. Th these chairs came from the old tabernacle in Detroit, Michigan, back in the 1930s, Dr. J. Frank Norris. I'm indebted to Bill Grady and Jack Patterson, a few other heretics. Now, what America needs is the kind of preaching that the people sat on these chairs heard 55 years ago. America wasn't built by Susie McCutey and her evangelist husband with his lizard shoes and his white suit and his toupee with his cute little wifey whose jaguar is broken. America was built by old-fashioned, hell-raising, barnstorming, leather-long creatures. Preaching, 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 preaching. Not only, not only, and by the way, I'll say this, preaching's almost extinct. They're making fun of this today. Not only has there been a certain gospel handed to me that I have preserved and handed down to those who follow. Not only has there been a set of standards handed to me, I preserved and handed down. Not only has there been soul winning handed to me, I preserved and handed down, but there has been preaching and there has been a book. My mama. My mama took that very book right there. That's my mama's Bible. That very book she took when I was a boy. Read for me 30 minutes every night. No, no picture taken, please. I'm preaching. I want you to listen. I'm not posing. I'm preaching. After the service is over, meet me in the alley. I'll pull a strip to the waist for you when they get through. <laughs> My mama took that Bible right there. She read that to me 30 minutes every night. She held that Bible up like this every night and said, Son, 
This Bible contains the very words of God. The Bible is the Word of God. I had to say it three times. The Bible is the Word of God. Say it again. The Bible is the Word of God. Say it again. The Bible is the Word of God. Say it again. <laughs> One time, I was looking through my mama's Bible, and I will declare, if I didn't see it was a King James Version. So I just decided to preserve the one she handed me. Now I'm not going to betray my mom at night and read the NIV next Sunday morning. Some of you guys are too smart for God. Every preacher in this room tonight, when he went off to college, thought he had the Word of God in his hands. And you thought that till you met a professor. I've got a book here, 26 translations of the Bible. Well, it says, and this learned, by the way, let these guys make their translations. It keeps them out of trouble. <laughs> they might be out mixing in England. Well, they couldn't go soul one in. The complete text. The King James appears in boldface type. Other versions are identified at the end of each quotation. There's good speed, an improved edition, American Baptist Publication Society, the Amplified Bible, the Bible in basic English, the New Berkeley Version, the Jerusalem Bible, a New Testament translation of the Bible by Moffat, the New American Bible, the New English Bible, the Emphasized Bible, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, the Revised Version of the Bible, the Living Bible, the, and you might add, if you want to, the New King James, New Schofield, NIV, American Standard, and Reader's Digest Version. You want to think about this book? That's what I think about it. That's the book. That's the book. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. That means if I live, I've got to have an every word Bible. An every word Bible. Not an every thought Bible. Not an every sentence Bible. An every word Bible. Somebody said, you believe in verbal inspiration? I go beyond that. My Bible said every jot and tittle. I believe in tittle inspiration. Oh, I know what you're saying. He's a Ruckmanite. I never met Mr. Ruckman. Never saw Mr. Ruckman. Never read a book about Mr. Ru by Mr. Ruckman. Never heard a tape by Mr. Ruckman. I'm not a Ruckmanite. Bless God, I'm a Mamaite. And your mama believes the same Bible my mama believes. Same book. Starting to get good. I, I'm, I'm doubting your salvation. The old book is under attack tonight. The Gideons. American Bible Society. Why don't we declare war on Bible haters? Not only if I receive a gospel and standards and soul winning and preaching and a Bible, but I have received the blood. 
Same old blood. Same blood my old pastor preached. Not just the blood, not the lamb, not just the blood of the altar, but the blood of the mercy seat. Not just the blood of the backyard, but the blood of the doorpost in the middle. Not only am I mad at Mr. MacArthur, but I'm mad at you folks that put up with it. You say, I just don't like your preaching, and I don't like your believing. Not only has there been a certain gospel, standards, soul winning, preaching, and book handed down to me, there has been a certain reaching of the poor handed down to me. The message of grace that was handed down to me was reaching everybody, no matter how poor, no matter what color, no matter how rich, no matter how poor, no matter how high, no matter how low, and that's what was handed down to me, and that's what you've seen this week at First Baptist Church of Hammond. When I came here, rich people came to me and said, I've had it all the time, Sam. Rich people came to me and I came here and said, we're not going to put up with these bus kids. And they said, it's us or the bus kids. I chose the bus kids. I'd like to resurrect those guys from the dead. They were dead before they died, but I'd like to resurrect them from the dead. I'd like to have the same chance to make that same choice again. I'll take the City Baptist kids. I'll take the deaf. I'll take the poor public school kids. I'll take the bus kids. I'll take the Spanish folks. I'll take the common man along with the rich man. I'm not fighting for myself tonight. I'm fighting for those prisoners of the ghettos of Chicago. But Chicago has something most cities don't. Chicago has an old church out here in Hammond, Indiana. The ghettos of Philadelphia don't have one. The ghettos of New York City don't have any. Some fine churches there. But I'm saying there, is, there are literally millions and millions and tens of millions of little kids like you saw, have seen this week, that nobody gives a hoot about. Why? We're so busy worshiping, nobody cares about them. When I was not long ago, so folks out soul winning came to me, said, Preacher, we're soul winning today in Chicago. We're witnessing to a young, some young people, <coughs> and there was an old couple that was watching, very old. They began to weep. We looked up and saw the old couple weeping and asked them why. And they said, because many, many years ago, somebody else came by this house when we were little. Not trying to fill up a bus, but trying to fill up a wagon drawn by horses. They said, who was that somebody? And they said, we don't know their names, but the pastor of the church was a man named Dwight L. Moody. I said, glory to God, almost 100 years after Moody, there is still a church in Chicago that loves those people. If my deacons called a meeting tonight and said, you give up the bus, kids, or, or, or we'll fire you, I'd go across the parking lot and start a church tomorrow morning. One of our deacons years ago called me out there on the front. This building wasn't there then. 
He parked the buses in those days across the street. He said, Pastor, I'm sick and tired of all these buses. I said, you're going to get sicker and tireder, too. He said, Mr. Moody, didn't run buses all over Chicago? I said, no, he didn't. They hadn't invented buses in those days. They ran horse-drawn carriages all over Chicago. He said, Pastor, there's oil leaking out of those buses all over the parking lot. I said, I wonder what leaked all over Mr. Moody's parking lot. He wrapped his phylacteries around his pharisaical chest and said, but that all stinks. <laughs> Mr. Moody's parking lot didn't smell like Chanel number five. <laughs> if you don't love the poor, you don't love Jesus. Yeah. If you don't love the poor, you're not right with God. Yeah. And if you're not reaching the poor, you're not a Bible preacher. Not only has there been a gospel, a set of standards, a type of soul winning, certain preaching, a book, the blood, the poor, but there has been handed down to me from those who preceded me an informal kind of worship. And let me just tell you something. You can't be a fundamentalist and sing a sevenfold amen on Sunday morning. Amen. 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 Won't you swap that for an old rugged cross? There's not one thing in this Bible about a Sunday morning worship service. Not a thing. Show me one. Not a one. You got it from the mother of harlots. I can see old sister Johnson now. Back in the 1930s. Fernwood Baptist Church. Every time somebody would get saved, she'd come unscrewed. That's what was handed down to me. And that's what I aim to preserve. First church I pastored had a lady named Mrs. Jim Ford. Mrs. Ford had an unsaved husband. His name was Jim. You caught it just like that. Name was Jim. She, Jim was a drunkard. Every Saturday night, Miss Ford and I and some others have a prayer meeting over at the church. And she crawled while she prayed. And she screamed while she prayed. I can hear her now. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, please save Jim. Oh, Jesus, please save Jim. Oh, Jesus, please save Jim. One Sunday night was Christmas on, came on Sunday. Miss Ford sitting over here next to the aisle. She didn't know it, but Jim came in late and sat back here on the back row Christmas night. I got about two-thirds through with my sermon. Old Jim jumped up and screamed, Hey, Reverend, I can't wait no longer. He came down that aisle. Mrs. Ford saw him come. She came unscrewed. She... She went to everybody in the, on the aisle over here. Mrs. Ford weighed about 240 pounds. I weighed 135. <coughs> she went down that aisle. She hugged everybody, picked them up, and shook them right there. <laughs> Saying, thank you, Jesus, for saving Jim. Thank you, Jesus, for saving Jim. And I saw her coming.
She got me. Picked me up like a jar and shook me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving Jim. Thank you, Jesus, for saving Jim. See, I had enough of that when I was a kid. For I can't stomach your Gloria Patre. I can't stomach your high church anthem. Give me blessed assurance. Give me at Calvary. Give me at the cross. Give me dwelling in beautiful land. Give me the gospel song. Old Percy Ray, he asked me to come preach down at Myrtle, Mississippi. Wildest bunch of Indians you ever saw in your life. I've never been there. I walked to the door back there. Percy was up on the upright piano. He weighed about 300 pounds. He was on the upright piano, standing up there preaching. He was preaching on the rapture. He was Jesus. He had somebody all planned to blow a trumpet. That trumpet sounded, and he came from the sky. And brother, we lifted up toward him. Old Percy got I sitting over here. I'd never been there before. I was young. I was just about 33 years old. Old Percy came up down the aisle hugging everybody. He weighed 300 pounds. I weighed 140. He got to me. He hugged me. He finished hugging me and went to the fellow behind me, and then he stopped and came back to me, and he said, I felt something. I said, so did I. <laughs> he said, what'd you feel? I said, I felt you hugging me. He said, I felt it. I said, what'd you feel? He said, you're supposed to preach right now. I said, you better hug me again. <laughs> Check it out. See, I cut my preaching teeth that way. I cut my preaching teeth down to St. Mary's Baptist Church, a black church. Sit down, black man. I cut my preaching teeth at a black church where we stayed till 11.30 every Wednesday night. Brother, if we didn't have a conga line and shout around that place, we were backslidden. I'd be preaching about an hour and a half into the sermon, closing my introduction, just like I am tonight. And old Deacon Busty would stand up and start swaying from side to side. Eyes rolling. Let me give you some theology. Let me exegete. If the eyes don't roll, shouting's counterfeit. <laughs> then Mr. Deacon Buss's neck, the whole row would start getting up, so it swayed side to side. Then this whole section, men sat over here, women sat over here. <coughs> this whole section swaying side to side. And Deacon Busty was up with an unseen force, would, would go out in the aisle like this. And then he'd start swaying like that. And the black man behind him would put his hands on Deacon Busty's waist. And they'd line up around the section over here, all of them singing, What could I do without the Lord? What could I do without the Lord? And then Sister Busty came unscrewed over here. She'd go to sway it from side to side. Eyes rolling. Then the ladies would get out and form a conga line. Many a, many a Wednesday night. Twelve o'clock at night. Kerosene already burned up. Didn't know how many were there because they were black and the night was black. I just count the eyes and divide by two. Many a Wednesday night, Dr. Jack Hines, the Chancellor of Hiles Anderson College, the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, many a Wednesday night, I have had my hands on the waist of that black man in front of me, doing the conga line around that building, 
singing, what could I do without the Lord? You, you have a little bit of that. You'll never get satisfied with the glory of pottery again. You see, that same professor said this book wasn't true, taught you how to have a service. He wouldn't know an old-fashioned meeting from a toe dance. I'm saying a certain informality. <coughs> if it is not the old-time religion, it is not fundamentalism. He said, I'm mad at you. Listen, you'd have to get in line. <laughs> There's so many folks don't like me these days, you may never get to me in my lifetime. And bless God, if, if three million don't like me, three million and one is not going to cause me to lose any more sleep. I'm going to say this, and I, I, I don't want to belabor this. But the real battle tonight is far bigger than they make it seem. The real battle tonight is over this book. The real battle tonight is over the old-time religion. The real battle tonight is over standards and separation. The real battle tonight is over revival-type, old-fashioned, revival-type Christianity. Fundamentalism is passing off the scene. I promise you that if a miracle doesn't take place, and if you don't take up the standard and lift it high, I promise you that in 35 years, there won't be a fundamentalism like we have in this conference this week. It's up to you. I'll be gone. It's up to you. I've done what I can. I'm not going to turn back or quit. I aim to be around a while. But let's face it, Dr. Tom alone won't be here a long time. Brother Joe Boy won't be here a long time. Brother Hiles won't be here for a long time. Be many a meeting, many a meeting that you'll go to and you'll remember tonight. Who's going to stand up here then and say what I'm saying tonight? You know why you come to pastor school, most of you? Because you want somebody to say to a huge crowd of people what you would give your eye teeth to say. Oh, bless God, I'm saying it. Oh, Dr. Hal Buckner, years ago, was on the mission field, spent his life on the mission field. He came back home. He's an old man. He came back home to retire. Spent the last years of his life in, in America. He stood to speak. When he spoke one night, he cried and said, who will go to China? Take my place. Nobody moved. The invitation came. Nobody walked the aisle. Who will go to China to take my place? Nobody came. Came time to close the service. Old Dr. Buckner looked out and said, I'll go back. Then I'll go back. And go back he did. Summer, 1988. I was preaching at Bob Jones University and I lost my memory. I don't recall the sermon. For three hours I didn't know my own name. My doctor took all kinds of tests, checked my heart, found it cold. He checked my head, found nothing there.
He said he almost sure it was hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. But I got scared. I took this man out to eat. I talked to him about the future of the church, how to choose my successor. I took this man out to eat. I talked to him about the future of the church and how to choose my successor. I took this man out to eat. I talked to him about the future of the church and who'd be my successor. I took this man out to eat. I talked to him about the future of the church. Who'd be my successor? I took him out to eat and him and him. Were you here then, Jeff? Oh, you were you, you here? Talk to, talk to each of my staff members. We talked about some way to choose my successor because I was scared, not scared of dying, but scared that something was wrong and I could not continue pastoring the church. <laughs> And I wrestle with this thing. And I wrestle with it. Who will be my successor? And one day in the woods, I prayed and prayed and prayed for God to help me to know how to choose somebody to take my place. I jumped up after praying for three or four hours. And I said, I know who ought to follow me. Me. Yeah. And so I volunteered to succeed myself. You guys have to wait. I've asked God to give me ten more years. Ask God to give me three score and ten. That's what he promised me. But Brother Joe, don't tell God this. But when I get to three score and ten, I'm going to ask him for another ten. <laughs> he doesn't know that. Now let's just, let's put the jelly down where you can face it. Listen now. What you going to do about it? What you going to do? Try to make some money? That's going to save America, isn't it? Work your way up in your company. That'll save America, won't it? Well, that'll do it. What you gonna do, you guys, you laymen? What you gonna do? Huh? You gonna, you gonna uh, buy a lot of real estate and, and get wealthy? That'll help, won't it? Let me tell you something. Every single man in this room tonight who's come to this pastor's conference ought to examine himself and say with the grace of God, what does God want me to do to save this nation? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall lead to Christ, his Lord and Master, and Christ, his Lord indeed. What you gonna do about it? What you going to do about it? What are your preachers going to do about it? Won't you buy some man medicine? Got hair on your chest? Muscle on your arm? Won't you get some grit in your crawl? Leave this place. Scatter across this country. By the grace of Almighty God, let's build soul winning churches in every area, nook and cranny of this nation. Dedicate yourself anew tonight. Old fashioned soul winning, old fashioned preaching, old fashioned standards, old fashioned public services, the old fashioned gospel. And those of you that are not preachers, you ought to surrender to the call of God tonight. He's calling many of you. Walk down these aisles and say, by the grace of Almighty God, I am going to give my life to preserving what's been handed down to me. Faith of our fathers, living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Give me that old-time Give me that old-time religion. Give me that old-time religion. It's good enough. 
It was good for Lester Roloff. It was good for Lester Roloff. It was good for Lester Roloff. It's good enough. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. I've preserved it. I'll be 64 in September. But I preserved it. Brother McElroy, I adored you. You look a lot like Joe Boyd looks, built about the same way Joe Boyd built. I'll never forget that day you took me and lowered me in the baptismal waters. I'll never forget that day that when I was standing up on the pew as a little lad, barefooted, my daddy had come home, beat my mama the night before. And you said, dear God, save Jackie boy. And I stopped to realize that you're praying for a little ghetto-bound son of the neighborhood drunkard. I've been preaching for 43 years. Brother McElroy, I preached the same gospel last Sunday morning. You handed down to me years ago. Brother Sizemore, if you look at my young people, they look a lot like ours used to. Not one single conviction, Brother Sizemore, that you handed to me that I've changed. Brother Jesse Cobb, I'm still doing it, just like you taught me. And I've tried to hand it down. Mama, look carefully, Mama. It says King James Edition. And I've handed it down, just like you gave it to me. And I'm a little tired, Mama. I get weary more than I used to. I've thought about Brother Joe so often. He's 10 years older than I. I don't know how he keeps going. I haven't had a vacation over 20 years. I went over 20 years and didn't even miss a Sunday morning at church here. Until I had pneumonia last fall. I get tired. I beg you, dear Jesus, give us some people to take it. Some people to whom we can hand down before we're gone what was handed down to us. Our Heavenly Father. I did not know when I stood to speak how long I could talk. I've cleared my throat tonight. I've taken everything I can take, gargle everything I know how to gargle. And I want to praise you that you let me preach. Oh my God, tonight, move in this place. Give us men, young men, men, to take what we have received and guarded and guard it for the next generation. Our heads are bowed. God's moving in your heart. How many of you men of God, you preachers, you'd say, Brother Hiles, in some area of my ministry, I've drifted. I don't preach like I used to preach. Witness like I used to witness. Stand like I used to stand. Preacher, I've lost some of my joy. Tonight, I want it back. I want it back. Pray for me. I want it back. Raise your hand, preacher. Raise your hand, preacher. Who else? You may lower your hand. Oh, may God help us to leave this place flaming evangels to do the work to save the country.
Father, bless this closing moment. Please bless it with power. Amen. Here it is tonight. I want you to, I want you to, ha I want to hand it down to you. Oh, I'm going to be preaching it for a while, several years. But the t somebody's got to start training. Somebody's got to get ready. So tonight, if God's touched you to carry the torch, come up here and take it. God spoke into your heart. Tonight, you're surrendering your life to preach the gospel. Come right on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't wait. Come on now. Come on. Come on. Here it is. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Say something. Come on. Come on. Come on. A little louder. Come on. Come on. Stand up here beside me. Come on up here beside me. Come on up here beside me. Come on. Come on. Who's going to take it? Who's going to carry it? Come and get it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. God's not through yet. Come on. Come on. Here it is. Come and take it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Play the old time religion, Miss Colston. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's right. That's it. Come on. Come on. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Who's going to carry it? Who's going to take it? Hey, what you do? Won't you get rich? That'll save America. Work your way up the ladder you, of, your, of your company. That'll save America. No, sir. Preaching that'll save America. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Where are you? Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Here it is. Come and take it. That's it. Come on. That's it. Amen. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Come on. Come on. God's not through yet. Come on. Come on. Come on. We're waiting on you. We'll be here all night if we have to. There he is. Come on. There he is. Come on. Come on. There he is. Come on. Here they are. Come on. That's right. That's it. Come on. Come on, teenage boy. Come on, young married man. Come on. Come on. Somebody's got to carry it. Who'll take it? I'm handing it to you. Who'll take it? Come on. There he comes. Come on. That's right. There he comes. Come on. There he comes. That's right. Come on. Come on. Come on. There he comes. Come on. Come on. There he is. There he is. There he is. Come on. There he comes. Hey, there he comes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up there. Come on. There they come. There he comes. There he comes. Come on. Come on. There he comes. There he comes. There he comes. There he comes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Who's going to carry it? Just hand it down to us. Who's going to take it? You going to make money? Get famous? There he comes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey, it's recruitment time. Come on. Recruiting time. The army of Jesus. Come on. Hey, you know who you are. Come on. Come on. Get out of your seat. Come on. You know who you are. Come on. Come on up here. Hey, there he comes. Come on. Come on. You know who you are. Come on. We're not through yet. Here he is. Who? Come on. We're not through yet. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There he comes. Come on. We're going to wait till you come. Israel, go ahead. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. 
Who's going to carry it? Who's going to take it? Come on. Come on. Burn a sack of match to your dream. Burn your plans. Come on. There he comes. Come on. Come on. Come on. There he is. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. You're going to wait. Come on. Come on. We're going to wait for you. Come on. There he comes. There he is. Come on. There he comes. Come on. Choir, sing it. Give me that old time religion. Sing it, choir. Come on. Come on. There he comes. Come on. There he comes. Come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Some of you black folks do the conga line. Come on. There they come. There they come. Come on. Come on. Come on. Sing it, choir. Come on, come on, there he comes, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, there they come, one, two, three, four, five, come on. Amen, there he is. Come on, there it comes. Come on, come on, come on. There he is, come on. There he comes. Come on, come on, there he comes. There he comes, amen. Amen. Come on. Hey, look at there. Come on. There he is. There he comes. Sing it. Old time. Hey, there he comes. There he comes. There he comes. There he comes, there he comes, there he comes. <laughs> come on, there he comes, come on, come on. Hey, there he comes, there he comes, come on. Come on. We're waiting for you. Come on. Come on. Come on. We're not through yet. No, we're not through. God's not through. Come on up there. Come on. You know who you are. You know who it is God's speaking to. You know who you are. You know who you are. Come on. Come on. Come on. To that old time religion. Oh, I don't want to warn you. Hold it. I want to warn you. We're going to sing it through four times. Now, you know you're out there, and you know who you are. I don't know who you are, but you know who you are. And God knows who you are. And God has spoken to your heart about carrying the message that was handed down to us 
that we preserve for you. We're going to sing it four times through. I want to warn you. That's all. And some of you, there he comes, are going to miss the will of God for your life. Four times, that's it. It's up to you. You come. Here he comes, right here on the front row. Amen. Hey, his wife is ugly. Amen. Four times through, choir, sing it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Hurry, hurry, hurry. There he comes. There he comes. Come on. That's once. There he is. Amen. There he comes. 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 Amen. 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 Come on. Come on. Come on. Amen. There he comes. Come on. Come on. Now, you guys that are here, let's see if you can sit down. I want, to know, I want to see the ones I'm talking to here. Some of you are going to have to go back to your seat. We, the, our altar's not big enough for you. This means this, fellas. It means sacrifice. It means preparation. It means getting ready. It means for some of you ladies out there, a lot of tearful nights. It means the little house has got to be sold. It means you've got to trade a car in for one that's cheaper. It means a little apartment for four years. It means sacrifice. But I'll guarantee you, you'll never lay a thing on the altar for Jesus. He doesn't more than amply yeah. give you a cover. Come on. You just promise God right now, next September, you're going to be in an old-fashioned college somewhere preparing yourself. Shh. We can recommend you one, yeah, of course. But, but, but. Don't pass around. Go to the right. Now, it means, it, this does not mean you're going to preach at the rescue mission every first and third Thursday night. This means you're giving your life. I was in a service one night, I guess, that night I think it was. Anyway, on Sunday I was in a service, and that man right there walked the aisle, did exactly what you guys have done. It's been 47 years ago. He's still at it. Amen. One night I was in a service, he was right behind me. God called me to preach, and I was embarrassed to walk the aisle. When Joe walked the aisle, turned his life to preach, everybody cheered. And hollered when I walked the aisle, everybody grunted. <laughs> Little old run of a kid, I walked down the aisle and I said, Brother Sizemore, God's called me to preach. And he said, are you sure? <laughs> it's been almost a half a century. Brother Joe, we're still at it. <laughs> well, let's, I want, you, I want you to do this. I want you to walk down your home church Sunday. Let everybody, let everybody you, you can know about it. Broadcast it. I mean, get yourself so far out you can't go back. I, I, obligate yourself to your own integrity. <laughs> Just go ahead. Spread it all around. Let everybody know about it. Walk the aisle Sunday morning, Sunday night one. Let the people know in your home church what you've done. All right. I think... The Lord usually counted people. Let's see how many we have. How many? 146. 146. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. 47. You 
Hunter coming. 148. 149. 149. 149. There's 150. Come on now, I know there's more of us out here. My dad died with the Bible in his hand and prayed for me to become a preacher. I'm up here to rededicate my life for the Lord. Our forefathers have paved the roads for us, and now it's time to get out on our own shovels and dig the roads for our, for our kids and for our kids' kids. This book is word for word. And we take it for granted because our fathers can preach it pretty good, but now it's time that we preach it good. For our kids can preach it. Praise the Lord, guys. I know you guys are up there. Come on down. Come on down. Hundred and fifty one of it here. Our Heavenly Father. I see mission fields tonight. I see lonely, dark villages. I see country pulpits and country churches. I see evangelists standing behind pulpits preaching revivals. I see pastors of large city churches. I see these men of God who've said tonight, God is called and I've answered. Bless them and use them. Oh, my God, so that a long time after many of us old codgers are looking over the battlements of the glory land, there'll still be a pastor school. Somebody will still gather thousands together, and we can still feel the old-time way and the old-time power. Bless these men tonight. God, use them mightily and make them great men of God. Amen. A big hand while they go back to their seats. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. I give you a hug. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands. Amen.